All right, everyone, we got Will here with us. Right now, we're currently looking at Bitcoin sitting around $48,000 or so. Uh, let's start with the Realized Price Distribution or URPD. What are you seeing there? Yeah, so this is just basically um, on-chain volume profile. Um, you're basically looking at like at which different price levels of a certain amount of Bitcoin was moved. Um, and so like we have this massive zone of volume that was formed while we went sideways for three months between 30-40K. Uh, and that's below us. And then as well, we have a fair amount of distribution, kind of like the mid 40 Ks between call it like 44 to, to 47 K that we're kind of, uh, we, well, we just now broke through that. So, um, yeah, we, we have a good amount of, uh, support under us in, in that sense. All right. And then the miners, when China banned a bunch of the miners, uh, obviously hash rate dropped significantly, but the miners that stayed on, what happened with them? They got super profitable. Yeah, so when we had this big drop in hash rate, we had a record difficulty adjustment that followed. And so what it meant is that the miners that were still left on the network became way more profitable, especially in North America. Um, and so this is shown in, in this chart, what you see is um, the, the green line is is uh, hash per, I'm sorry, revenue per hash. Um, and then the purple line is just the, the hash rate. And so what you see is this correlation between um, as, as hash went down and we had the difficulty adjustment, then the miners, like we just said, still on the network were more profitable. But as hash has started to slowly come back on the network over the last few weeks, uh, that profitability is kind of fizzling out, if you will, but it, you know, it's still way higher than it was uh, compared to a few months ago. Uh, but yeah, hash is starting to come back online slowly, still far from, you know, where it was before the, the Chinese, uh, you know, minor migration, but, you know, it's looking positive. And so when we look at their actual net position change, this has been positive. They've been accumulating Bitcoin, not selling it for a while now. Has that continued? Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, it just it makes sense because they're more profitable, right? So they don't have to sell as many Bitcoins to cover their operational costs. Um, and so this is looking at the 30 day change between minor balances 30 days ago on the 20th uh, of July versus August 20th. And so what you see is that you know, it's, it's been staying in the green and over the last, you know, call it week or so, it's actually moved up. So yes, seeing strong accumulation from miners, which, you know, as we just looked at the profitability, uh, you know, completely makes sense. Yep. So it's pretty much since the beginning of July, once they went from selling a bunch of Bitcoin uh, to now holding it, accumulating it, uh, that's actually accelerated as well, which we're seeing here in the chart. Another metric that you uh, included this week, which uh, I don't think I actually understand, is market cap to thermo cap ratio. Explain to us what is this and then what is this chart showing us? Yeah, sure. This was created by uh, Nick Carter. It's just looking at the, the market cap of Bitcoin in comparison to like the total revenue that miners have ever brought in, if that makes sense. And so like what you basically get is these over and under heated zones and obviously like the peak of the, the bull and the bottom of the bear in terms of like the speculative premium that's bid up on the marginal uh, from the marginal buyer in comparison to um, the, the, the revenue that miners are bringing in. Yeah, so super bullish to see it kind of uh, what appeared to be it was going down and that trend reversed uh, pretty significantly and we're kind of headed back up now. Yeah, and then also we never really uh, reached like a real overheated zone, at least hist you know compared to historical peaks. Uh, and, and yeah, so like over the last couple of weeks, this started to move back up as well. Yep. One of my favorite stats right now is the realized cap uh, is at this all time high. Explain what realized cap is and then uh, what you think uh, kind of the ramifications of it hitting an all time high are. Yeah, realized cap was also created by uh, Nick Carter. Uh, this is basically looking at if anybody doesn't know, Nick Carter is like crazy smart. Um, realized cap is basically the, the average weighted price of Bitcoin. So it's the capitalization based off of when coins were last moved. So like you know, if, if you bought $100,000 of Bitcoin at a dollar, well, then you're adding $100,000 to realize cap. If those coins have still not moved since when you bought them at a dollar, then it's still only added $100,000 to realize cap. While, you know, in, in market cap terms, you're, you're just, um, you know, that's like four point whatever now we're at 48K. So it's $4.8 billion. That's uh, the chunk of, of market capitalization that those coins are contributing to. So it's basically like a VWAP, which is a, a volume weighted average price of Bitcoin. Um, and so like seeing that, seeing that reaching new highs is showing two things. Um, well, not to a few things. So like a coins are, are being, um, they're no longer being sold at a loss because like, if you, like I said, it's, it's based off of when they're last moved. So if they're last moved at 60 K, 
and then they were moved at 30K, well, you have $30,000 removed from the realized cap. So seeing, seeing it go up is showing that coins are moving from below and not above. Um, and so also it's showing that there's new capital inflows um, that, that's coming in and, and, and they're buying at these higher prices. So uh, it's a really good sign basically showing like the market's absorbing um, the profits that are being taken from below. So bullish. Uh, if we take the realized cap a step further, you've got David Puel's, uh MVRV here. What is MVRV uh, and then what is it showing us? Yeah, this is a simple ratio basically taking what we just described as the realized cap, um, a ratio of that in, in the market cap. Um, and then this is the Z-scored version. So it's adjusted for volatility and it just kind of gives you like crisper signals on the, on the upside. Um, and so you, you get these very similar to the market cap to thermo cap. You get these overheated uh, zones in, in the top of the bull market. And then also you get these like nice buy zones in the bear. Uh, we kind of briefly dipped into the overheated zone, but we didn't break above it like we did uh, historically. Um, but yeah, we, we've started to see a recovery in this as well over the last like two weeks, especially over the last week. So it's another really positive sign. Uh, basically, like the way you can think of this is when, when it goes up, it's basically showing that the marginal buyer is bidding the price up higher. Um, it's at a higher premium comparison to like what the average price is that investors paid for their coins. So when this blows way out out of proportion, then it's it's the marginal price is way higher than what the actual average price is that investors bought in. So they, therefore, the market's overheated by definition. Um, and then also in the bear market, like when market cap goes below realized cap, you're in capitulation by definition because the, the market cap is below the average price that investors paid for their coins. That makes sense. You've got these three supply related ratios that we've been tracking now for a couple of weeks, things like the illiquid supply shock ratio, et cetera. Uh, describe uh, kind of what you're seeing in all three of those supply ratios. Yeah, people have been hearing me talk about this for like crazy for the last three weeks, probably sick of hearing about these things. But, but you were right, uh, but so, you were right. Don't <laughs> let the haters ever say that you were wrong. You were right in terms of what was gonna happen in the supply shock, keep going. Yes, so we, we've got the illiquid supply shock ratio, and that's basically looking at a, a qualitative view of um, the movement of coins from, from weak hands or entities that are like moving coins in and out all day, um, and the movement of, of those coins to strong hands are basically entities that have very low um, selling history, so they take a lot of coins in, don't move a lot out. Um, and so this has been pretty much up only for the last couple of weeks. Uh, saw another uptick in this over the last few days. So that's a really good sign. Um, the green line is, is the long-term holder supply shock ratio. So very similar, but instead of looking at the spending behavior, it's just looking at um, the, the age of the entities. So it, it's over 155 day threshold is, is the cutoff for long-term holder, short-term holder. Um, and so seeing this moving up is showing that coins are moving from short-term holders to long-term holders. It's also showing that uh, the, those previously um, entities that were previously recognized as short term are aging past that 155 day threshold. So showing that these entities that accumulated those coins 155 days ago are now starting to cross into that long term threshold and are holding strong. Um, that's also reflected in like hot waves, which is very similar in the sense of like what's it, what it's kind of showing. Uh, hot waves is just showing like this the percentage of supply that was last moved in a certain time frame. So you're seeing really strong maturation of coins in that sense as well. Uh, so yeah, so this is a really good sign. And then the, the purple line is the exchange uh, supply shock ratio. This is just basically looking at, um, you know, the amount of coins that are available to be bought on exchanges relative to the overall supply. Um, this is just kind of in sideways, uh, you know, so kind of sideways neutral, but uh, yeah, the, the liquid supply and the, the long-term holder supply are, are looking really bullish. When we look at the long-term holder supply, we've got uh, another chart here that shows, um, you know, through 2018 and 2019, there's these two big upward movements that led to pretty significant price increases afterwards, you know, shortly after. It appears that we're now looking at a third very large increase in the long-term holder supply. Uh, is your expectation that, you know, kind of history repeats? Yeah, so like there's a couple things to unpack here. Um, this is basically just looking at the portion of supply. So just literally the percentage of supply held by these long term holders. Um, and so what you see is that, you know, in the bottom of the bear markets that uh, long term holders come in and, and they start buying discounted coins. And then when they get into the bull market, they, they distribute those coins. Uh, but in, in the bear market, when 
long-term holders hold a certain threshold of supply, then you get this supply squeeze effect because they lock up a certain, a certain portion. Um, and, and so like, it's, there's not a certain threshold, but what you see is that when, when you get this peak um, in terms of the movement from, from the short-term to long-term holders, uh, that, that's when you get those uh, supply shock. Like there's not a certain ratio necessarily that it crosses to say that it's going to initiate a supply shock. But in a general sense, the idea here is just to illustrate the fact that long-term holders set the floor basically. Um, and as we just touched on, long-term holders are accumulating really heavily right now. And so in my opinion, they are kind of setting the floor here. Um, one of the big things to, to point out is the rate of increase. So like when you look at, like when people look at this, one of the things they'll say is like, Oh, after 2017, you saw long-term holders also accumulating. So like, why is this bullish? Um, but what you really need to look at here in my opinion is the rate of change. Um, the, the rate of change here is, is way stronger than what it was in, in 2017. And then also the, the base that it was built off of is way higher. So like, if you look at the bottom of, of long-term holdings in 2017, you see it's almost at, aside from 2012, it was at the lowest it ever was. So it, it, was going to take a while for those long-term holders to reaccumulate those coins and initiate another supply shock, uh, which came in the bottom of the bear market in, in 2018. Um, but yeah, like, so we have a, a, a higher base for these long-term holders to, to build off of, and then also like a really high rate of change upwards. So uh, yeah, it's, it's just basically showing the same thing, just kind of in a broader sense that these long-term holders set the floor. And I suspect that's kind of what's going on right now. When we look at the illiquid supply shock ratio compared to 2017, uh, it looks like you've identified uh, almost the exact opposite of the end of a bull market. Explain what's going on here. Yeah, this is very similar. So we, you know, two two metrics ago, we explained the difference between the long term and, and illiquid supply. So this is the illiquid supply shock ratio over time, um, and what you see is like. In late 2017, this pretty much just dropped off a rock, well, dropped off like a rock, um, and then really didn't start moving back up. It kind of bottomed out in the bottom of the bear, and then started moving back up after the COVID crash instantly. I mean, um, um, ironically, so what we're seeing now is this reaccumulation that we've been describing, and and this you know when looking at 2017 looks nothing like what we saw heading into the bear market, where this metric pretty much just dropped off cliff. So. Yeah, complete opposite of, of what historically is, has marked kind of like bearish uh, price action. Bullish. All right, spent output age bands. Yeah, this is something we've been looking at in terms of like, is this a dead cat bounce or not? Because what you don't want to see is long-term holders taking exit liquidity and then just dumping on the first opportunity they get. Um, so this is looking at all the spent outputs above six, uh, six months, because that's the closest threshold I could get it to the long-term holders, which is um, five months. But looking at this, we really haven't seen anything alarming. Um, we did get some movement on Tuesday from two to three-year-old coins, um, but that was just, seems like it was just a one-off thing. Uh, overall, the trend is, is nothing alarming. Um, also looking at, you know, dormancy and uh, destruction, um, which is, basically coin days destroyed. Uh, and then also the, the average spent output lifespan. These are all basically saying the same thing, just kind of looking at the age of the coins moving. Uh, and, and yeah, like not seeing anything alarming there in the sense of like what we mentioned about long-term holders taking exit liquidity. So this is a good sign so far. When you look at things like uh, the entity adjusted NUPL, the net unrealized profit loss, what are you seeing? Yeah, like the premise of this metric is basically when you get into like a full blown bull market, people get really complacent and they don't want to take profits. Right. Um, and so like that basically sets up the, the market for a big capitulation. Once you finally get that move down because nobody's taking profits. So then everyone basically takes profit at once and causes a cascade. Um, and, and so you, you basically have these little zones. You have capitulation, hope and fear, optimism, anxiety, uh, belief, denial, euphoria, greed. We never reached a, the euphoria, greed zone that we have um, historically, uh, but we, we also interestingly bounced off the, the hope and fear threshold, uh, which is very similar to when you look back in mid-2013, what happened there, um, both after the 2013 and after the 2017 bull runs, when we started moving into the bear market, we actually did dip into that hope and fear zone. Um, so yeah, like that, that, that kind of distinguishes it for me in terms of like, is this kind of like a mid cycle thing or are we perhaps just seeing like a relief rally? Um, 
Yeah, it, it doesn't resemble it in that sense. Um, and, and we're starting to move back into that belief denial phase. So people are not realizing their profits, AKA kind of holding their coins. Stable coin supply ratio. Yeah, this is comparing uh, the market cap of Bitcoin uh, relative to the overall stable coin supply. Um, and, and so this is running like Bollinger Bands. Willie Wu did this, he ran Bollinger Bands over it. And what you see is that whenever the ratio dips below the bottom Bollinger Band, um, it is marked kind of like this historical uh, bottom, basically. You know, you see late 2018, uh, March 2020, September of last year, and then just recently, a few weeks ago, we, we went below. Uh, now we're starting to, to come back inside of the Bollinger Band. So that's basically showing to me that um, stable coins are starting to flow back into the market. And then very similarly, we have the stable coin exchange reserve ratio, which I created this week. Um, it's, it's just comparing the overall stable coin supply relative to the amount that that's on exchanges. Um, the only flaw here is that I need to filter it out for smart contracts. So for how, for how much uh, the, the amount of uh, stable coins locked up in those smart contracts. And then also I, I'm going to try to figure out a way to figure out um, how much of this is just coins that are being used as collateral because it's just showing that they're on the exchange. It doesn't necessarily say that, you know, are they just sitting idle ready to be deployed or are they already being locked in, you know, in, in some kind of futures contract as margin. But um, overall though, we still do have a, a pretty large portion of the stable coins that are, that are sitting on exchanges. So at least a, a, a portion of that can be presumed to kind of just be dry powder waiting to get in. So to me, that, that's showing that, you know, there's still capital on the sideline that, that is yet to kind of flow into the market. This is how you know Will's a young wizard. So he just casually dropped. Yeah, I looked, I just created this new metric this week. No problem. Um, all right, let's go to Sopra, uh, spent output profit ratio. Remind everyone what this is and, and explain what, uh, what it means that it's over one still. Yeah, I, Pomp, I think we've looked at this metric every week since we met. Um, this is this is looking at the profit taking of the coins, and then this is the A, the adjusted version, A Soper. Uh, this is basically looking at Soper, but but uh, filtering out the, the outputs under one hour. So it kind of just gives it a little more clear signal. Um, the one threshold is basically the kind of like the pull bear threshold, if you will. When, when the market is in kind of a, a bearish phase, it, it tends to stay below one. And in a, in a bullish phase, it stays above. Um, and so we got that breakout above one in late July, like three weeks ago. Um, and, and so what we wanted to see is twofold. So A, we wanted to see um, a retest of one as support if we got a price correction, and then also kind of see the, the ratio stabilize above one. So we got, you'll, you'll see right above uh, August 2nd on the, on the timeline on the bottom. Um, you'll see we we bounced off the the one threshold on a price drop, and then we've kind of just stabilized above one. So to me, um, I, I we had seen that bounce, and then I was I was just looking for the full confirmation with the stability above one. But I think we have that now after after kind of going hovering above it for the last couple of weeks. So to me, I think this is like a textbook sober reversal. So this is this is uh, one of the more bullish things. One of the things you told me a couple of weeks ago was if you had to make a bear case for Bitcoin at the time was the number of transactions or the active addresses was going down uh, and that wasn't good. It appears that it's coming back now. Yeah, um, this is like the one thing that I was kind of skeptical of, like when you looked at transactional activity, looked at the mempool, um, everything just looked kind of dead. But we are starting to see that move back up. Uh, so when you're looking at active addresses. You're also looking at just the, the number of transactions. Uh, both of these things are, are starting to move back up, which is a positive sign of, of kind of like follow through on this rally. Uh, but of course, want to see more continuation of that over the coming weeks. But so far, so good. All right. And then lastly, derivatives is something that I think you're starting to get deeper and deeper into. What are you seeing there? Yeah, a few things. So the, the chart I threw in the, in the newsletter this week was the, the futures estimated leverage ratio. Um, this is just looking at the amount of Bitcoin on an exchange relative to uh, the open interest. So it's it's trying to kind of ballpark the amount of leverage that people are using. So basically, like um, you know, the amount of how collateralized people are, uh, and and so looking at this, then also looking at funding, which is uh, the mechanism that's used to to peg the perpetual swap contract uh, to spot price. That's not near what the levels it, it was back in uh, you know February March earlier this year at, at similar price levels. Uh, yeah, so like overall it, it it looks pretty healthy. 
Um, but you know, we'll have to we'll have to watch over the coming weeks. If we start to see, you know, funding absolutely spike, then you know, we might get some kind of like short-term price pullback. But I think funding is best used when you're looking at the weight that open interest has against market cap. So you can take like a very simple ratio of just market cap to open interest and see, you know, what percentage of, of market cap is, is made up of, of open interest. Um, and, and so like when you go back earlier this year, that was way higher than where it is now. Um, we're, we're very similar to the to estimated leverage ratio. We're kind of, you know, we're, we're not really overheated in that sense at all. So yeah, derivatives for now look, look pretty healthy and there's nothing of, of kind of red alarm there. I got two last questions for you and then we'll let you go. First is I saw Dylan LeClaire say Bitcoin all time high September. When do you think we hit an all time high? Do you have a, uh, an estimation? Uh, do I say something for engagement or do I try to be objective here? <laughs> you um, pick, it's your, your answer. <laughs> let me see. I'm going to say this. I'll say by the end of the year, I think 75K is conservative. Whether we get new all-time highs next month, I, I think it's kind of up in, in the air to an extent. Um, it could depend on like some macro factors because you know macro doesn't look really great right now. So if we don't get like any of those existential threats, then I'll say, yeah, we get all-time highs next month. Okay, second question. Where we sit today, if you had to pick, what's the highest you could see it going? Not saying it's going there, but what's the absolute highest you could see Bitcoin going this year? Yeah, so I have a price model basically looking at like the historical tops. It, it's marked the historical top. It wasn't built by me, it was built by Willie. Um, it's top, marked the historical tops within like 5%. Uh, and so right now that model's sitting right around 176K. Um, Right now, though, so there's a couple different, if I get into the math of it, I'm probably going to bore people to sleep, but I'm looking for us to cross this this threshold of about 57, 58K. It's, it's sloping upwards, but once we cross that, um, I'll, I'll have full bull market confirmation, if you will, even though I, I'm pretty you know strongly believe that we are in a bull market right now. Um, but once we get over that, then I'll have that full confirmation, uh, which also by the time we get there, will probably be around all-time highs anyway. But once we get above that, I'd probably be targeting around uh, 92, 94K, which is the next uh, kind of uh, threshold in that model. So right now, looking to see if we get above that. Once we get above that, we targeting around mid 90Ks. And then if we can get above that, then, you know, we'll see where that top model is kind of sloping at. I suspect, you know, by then it'll probably be up near 200K because it's, it's sloping upwards. Uh, but yeah, for now, it's around 176K. So 176 to 200,000, not saying it's going there, but uh, it's possible. Yeah, you know, perhaps that'd be like the, the absolute cycle top. All right, man. Where can we send people to follow you on Twitter and uh, subscribe to the newsletter? Yeah, sure. Thanks for the plug. Um, I'm W Clementi III on Twitter. And then uh, the newsletters in my bio, it's just blockerintelligence.com. You, uh, you came on? And Bitcoin started absolutely ripping. It's at like almost 49,000 right now. Oh. Yeah. Whoa, look at that live oh. reaction. Look at the live reaction. Oh. oh, the people love to hear the young wizard when he talks about Bitcoin. <laughs> I, uh, I, it'll be very interesting. You have any, uh, any ideas to when we'll uh, break 50,000? I feel like that's like another big kind of psychological barrier. It's closer to I, 100 than zero. See, I, I think... 50K is probably the last logical level for bears because that's where we broke down from the lower low when we broke down in, you know, mid-May. Um, and so if we can get back above that, I think the whole idea of a dead cap bounce from a price structure standpoint, um, the probabilities of that are, are going lower and lower, especially once we get above that. 50K is also just like a nice round number. So we'll probably see some resistance there. Um, it depends though, like if, if we get there and everybody's shorting it, then odds are we'll, we'll probably break through relatively soon. Right. Uh, so we'll have to look at funding once we get up there. Um, but yeah, like if everybody's, if everybody's trying to long resistance, then yeah, we, we probably get a rejection there, at least for the, the short term. Um, but I think like 50 K is probably the last logical level for like a macro lower high. Um, 
and, and above that, I think it's, it's probably going to be pretty quick to that, that upper 50 K upper, you know, 60 K range. But I, I think like 50 K is like the final boss in my opinion. 50 K is the final boss. Joe and John are sitting here eyes wide, ready to roll. They're like, Hey, we'll take down that like wall. That. And then we'll see you at a new all time high going right through we, it. We, we all buy at the same time. We all coordinated on Twitter. <laughs> Willie whale. That's, that's what we're going to start calling you. Will the whale. All right, man. Listen, I, did my, I did my $50 uh, DCA buy this morning. So I'm doing my <laughs> there you go. He, play, he pushed them up. He was it. pushing it up. All right, man. Love listen, guys. thank you so much for doing this. Everyone appreciates when you come on. They absolutely love it. And uh, we'll do it again next Friday. Keep up the great work. I see you uh, absolutely just cranking out content on Twitter. So everyone make sure you go follow Will. Uh, probably the best follow. You, you are followers, by the way. Let's see, what are you at this week? Last week, you were uh, you were growing up. Oh, man, you're at 184,000. You are absolutely exploding right now. Yeah, it's, it's pretty wild, man. Like, sometimes I'll look at it and like, I'll have to double look and be like, do I really have that many followers? Real <laughs> quick for uh, jo jo Joe and John, end of year... Will Clemente follower prediction? Mm. It depends on the price. <laughs> I'm going uh, somewhere between. I'm bullish on the price, so I think it's going to be somewhere between. Uh, I'll say two seventy five. Two seventy five. John, I'm going to say three hundred plus. I got you, Will. <laughs> you guys are you guys are you haters. Saying? Will Clemente will end the year with over five hundred thousand followers. Oh shit, we. He's at 183, 500,000. He's got, he's got uh, as long as he keeps tweeting, he keeps doing high quality work, he's going to end up the year with over Yeah, Will, this is relying followers. on you here. So, Will, don't let me down. I man. changed my number. <laughs> <laughs> I got you, bro. I'll, I'll all keep right, posting. All right. We'll see. All right. We'll see you next Friday. Thanks for doing it, man. Thanks, Will. No problem. Take it easy, guys. Later. Hey guys, thanks so much for watching that clip of The Best Business Show. Make sure you like and subscribe to the channel, turn on notifications so you know when we go live every weekday, and then head to sofi.com slash pomp so that you can get an account and we can get after it.